this again. I, I I'm somewhat handicapped. I do not know, you know, the uh, the velocity uh, velocity of planet uh, X. I don't know how close we are. <clears throat> but any, um, you know, when you have a pressure wave in in, in front of a, a moving object, even right, something right. A, a thin fluid as uh, as space, uh, could yeah. some of this be? Let, let me yeah. Let me answer your question. I see where you're okay. at. Let me answer that. Okay. Is this a precursor? And, is this some of the some yeah, of the oh, uh, No, uh, no, absolutely, absolutely, it is. Uh, and I put now. You have to you have to understand something now. Uh, the uh, I I completed. Uh, and had the original release of the my report, the DVD disc. It's called Incoming. I called it Incoming, the the the, the story of Nibiru. Uh, that disc was completed about the end of 1990. Excuse me, uh, 2014. All right, about like uh, October, November was when I first started talking about it. It was available about that time. So that's going back, um, uh, you know, what, six months or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I had genuinely finished what I would consider the, the research and putting in the information and trying to uh, edit this thing and all. It's just uh, mind-boggling, like I said, the amount of uh, information and whatever that's in it. Uh, the editing is just unbelievable. So uh, the, my point is this. Back at that time, let's say as of the first of uh, before the first of this year at the end of last year of 2014 seven months ago it was done it was finished and was down in california being manufactured uh being uh, made available okay now in there i included some of the following i said that the winter that we have going through now and just so to speak of uh, phasing out of now uh, would be probably the most record-breaking winter in 100 years, and, and it is. Uh, in California, they're going through, going into now the fourth year of a drought that by the end of another couple of months, California will not be able to grow anything for uh, 50 years. It's a, the, the devastating amount of um, uh, drought and destruction to the crops in the southwest area of the United States is permanently devastating, probably injuring it already today to the tune of maybe 25 years before it gets back on its ground. Now, if it ever does, in the Northeast, all right, uh, in uh, New Jersey, New York, up there, Connecticut, the worst winter they have ever experienced since keeping records. I predicted that in the DVD. You will see that in the DVD where I talk about it. All uh -huh. right. The death, uh, the, the, the animals are still falling out of the sky. You know, we still have that. You know that thing? It's been going on for about four years. You know, That's millions of fish over here in Idaho 60 days ago, we had 2,000 Canadian geese fall dead from the sky in Idaho about four weeks ago. See, that was not on any news report that I would have picked uh, well, up. Yeah, and again, and you know, when, when, you, when you know this, you can look it up and you will find it, in, you know, in some little crack someplace. Yeah. But nonetheless, fortunately, because of the Internet, you can look these little things up, okay? And it, But if you're not a guy like myself who does it full time for the last 30 years, see, I have my tentacles are out all over the place. I have people call me about some stuff that I don't even want to hear. I mean, you know, talking about goofy things. But uh, I always have my feelers out. And when you put it all together, all of a sudden you look at it and say, oh, wow, wait a minute. Like, like how come there's like in the last four years, four, three, four years, how come there's astronomers dying? People that are studying Planet X are being killed. Twelve of them in one gondola in Switzerland at a meeting of astronomers, guys that were working on Planet X information. The cable broke, and they, 12 of them were dead. End of mm. story for those guys. There's about 50 of them in the last few years. As of today, there's probably 50 dead bankers, guys that were 29-year-old heads of 
international banking overseas that fit, that killed themselves. You know, the numbers of bankers who are finding out about the application of funds and where the money's disappearing to uh, is tremendous. They're all dead. They're killing them. They're killing them like crazy to keep them quiet. A lot of other people, good friend of mine, um, a fellow in, uh, in 95 um, that I had had met, his name's Phil Schneider. He was an engineer in some of these underground facilities back in the 90s. He had built and designed 13 of them for the government. He went out and started talking about things that he had discovered underground. And uh, he told me, I was with him in 95, my wife and I, we had dinner and he said, they're, they're trying to kill me. They said, they're gonna kill me. Uh, there's no question about it. They can't handle what I'm talking about. I'm t explaining these underground facilities. They, they're gonna take me out. And he said, um, he sat down with me as a matter of fact, and he said, I'm telling people things here in 95 that they don't understand, don't believe that it's way over their head. He said, Bob, you've been on the road doing these presentations for a while. Is there anything I can do so that the people will believe me that this stuff is real, what I'm telling them? And of course he had some extraordinary tales. And I said, um, and some of the things back then, I wasn't sure. I didn't know if this guy was uh, pulling my leg, you know, uh, pulling everybody's leg. Uh, but when he sat down with me and he said, I need your help because if I should leave some of it out, tell me what to do with that. Uh, do I dare talk about this and this and this, or should I only tell them half of what I know? You know, what do you think, Bob? And then, of course, I answered the best I could. But also, before I left, we were speaking together at, uh, at a, I think it was in Denver, Colorado. And he, before I left, he said, I want to give you some of my books because I, I worry about being dead, so um, being killed, eliminated. And, uh, and so I took some of his books. He gave me things, included the, his father's book, a couple things of his father's, when he was an engineering designer for Adolf Hitler. It was very precious stuff for him. But he passed them on to me, and two weeks later, he was murdered. He was dead. Wow. So the point that I'm making about this is that if this stuff is not serious, and if the bad guys are not really trying to keep this stuff quiet, then why are, all, why are they doing all these things? Why are they building, creating drills that can go inside a granite mountain and bore a hole big enough so that it goes in and they back it out and you can drive an 18-wheeler in the hole that they just dug? You know, in China, they are so concerned with getting these underground facilities completed, they built the drill that I'm just described to you, but three times that size. So that, think about that. Now I'm talking about a drill that can go into the side of a mountain and, and drill a hole, come back out and be big enough for an 18 wheeler to drive in the hole. Now we're talking- like The tunnel boring machine that we, yes, that we know of, yes. for example, that built the, uh, the That's tunnel. Right under the, right. the, the English Channel, yeah, it's a big, mm. Okay, but the Chinese have built one that's one on each side of the size that I was just talking about, wow. and then one in the middle that's one and a half as big as both of those, and it's all on one big operation, one big drill. Uh, that's what the Chinese are doing. Now, these people aren't stupid. Uh, you know, so if they're doing it, and our government's doing it, and the European governments are doing it, and Russia is doing it, why? All right? Now, they are also filling it with survival foods. Uh, survival foods for many years, for thousands of people, into all of these facilities. They are putting that in last year, and this year, on the basis that they're gonna need it in the next couple of years. They're not putting it in for 50 years down the road. They're putting it in for tomorrow. They're putting it in for as soon as they need it, 
it's going to be there. And they're already full up to the brim with survival foods. All right? Next question. People okay, ask it. You know, uh, this, uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Next question I have. Obviously, I was in here. I was listening to you. I was, I was reading down here through um, uh, through chapter six, seven, and eight of, of the book of Revelation. And now, as, as I've even stated on my radio show, with, with, which is tomorrow night, with as limited knowledge based on what I've read here uh, over the last couple of years about Planet X, you know the the effects that I read here in in, in um, about the sixth seal being broken uh, makes perfect sense. Uh, you know, uh, with the passage of, of Planet X, uh, gravitational disturbances will shift the, the poles, which would uh, cause the stars to be out of place, as John the Revelator, you know, referred to. But uh, as I look at this, you know, uh, it, obviously there, there will be uh, casualties, those that are not, so, in quote, selected uh, to or allowed to, to hide away. But also, it's, you know, Scripture is rather clear that there's going to be a large number uh, that are going to obviously survive the passing of this thing. <clears throat> but what I'm curious about, and this is just an opinion, uh, just I'm just asking an opinion question, is, is going to somewhat come out of the clear blue sky. I believe, uh, you know, in, in the the rapture of, of the true believer, the removal, Scripture tells us we're spared from God's wrath. I do not really look at God's wrath beginning until pretty much uh, after the seventh seal is broken. And so what I'm curious is, in, in, with respect to just getting your opinion, the, the rapture of the church, and I, I am a pre-tribulation rapture person, uh, when, where do you see uh, the rapture fitting in? I took some notes here. You know, I would like to say it's before, but it would seem logical to me that it could be during uh, or perhaps shortly thereafter the, the passing of, the, of this planet. That's, that's do you have correct. any thoughts on such things? Well, well, okay. No, see, and you see. Uh, uh, fortunately, you hit. Uh, it, was, it makes it makes it a little bit vague, so to speak, uh, because uh, fitting in the, the the biblical scripture that you're referring to as for in terms of the rapture, um, uh, and unfortunately, uh, it it as we we speak about Nibiru doing its standard physical uh, uh, effects uh, th that that I believe, unfortunately, it's going to do. And by the way, I would hope to be completely wrong on this, okay? You know, I wish I was totally wrong, and that um, a couple of years down the line, we could get back on the, on the, your program and, and laugh about it, uh, that, that in fact, uh, we're, we're still here. Um, but uh, I... I don't believe that to be the case. Uh, all right, in terms of uh, everyone's belief and understanding of the rapture, of course, is uh, widely varied. Uh, every Christian you talk about has a slight variation on the theme, so to speak. But it could, if it happens, as we and people of the Christian faith believe uh, in the rapture, those that do, like yourself, the, the answer to your question, you already answered it. It could happen before, during, or after the passing of Nibiru. Nibiru is, uh, uh, the effects will be, if it does, as it is projected by the people that have studied it, not only the biblical and historical part, but the potential scientific possibilities that could take place, and then all the rest of that, uh, and uh, astronomical uh, studies of it, that part of it, putting it all together, um, it, it does not necessarily uh, the end of Earth, all right, or the end of all of humanity, oh, no, but, it I, is, yeah. but it is, I believe, unfortunately, just strictly from looking at previous, the fact that it previously has passed by, that it will cause tremendous floods, number one, due to the um, uh, gravitational effects on the globe in general, pulling and pushing. You know, we forget that the moon and the sun uh, just floating around out here is what causes the, uh, the, uh, 
the variation of the tides every day. Oh. The tides go in, they go out, and it's a very minuscule gravitational effect. It's very small. If you take an item five times or seven times the size of Earth that's, that's a solid mass for the most part and have it pass uh, some place between us and the sun going around there, let's say going around the sun and then coming back out, uh, from that point of view, um, the gravitational effect will yank the oceans right out of the seabeds as was described in, in Noah's floods. They didn't, uh, they, they had no idea uh, where uh, the, the rains would come for 40 days uh, and, and all of that. Um, uh, but the, um, see there's a lot of things also uh, like, like the, the stars. I'm gonna give you a simple possibility when we talk about the stars uh, disappearing from the sky for a period of time, all right? That happened the last time Yellowstone's volcanic mountain blew up. When you looked up, if you were in the middle of the, the United States for the following five months or so, you wouldn't see any stars. That's true. So to a biblical person, it doesn't have to mean that the entire earth is moved in its location or anything like that. If we have 15 volcanoes go off, serious ones, at one time, uh, the stars will disappear for some unknown period of time. And all we're talking about is the residue in the air, the dust and the junk yeah. in the air. And even if you didn't have Nibiru, okay, you follow me? So, yeah. so uh, and by the way, I also predict in my DVD there uh, uh, several months ago when we finished it, that uh, volcanoes would be reactivated. They already are. Are you aware that there are as many as 45 active volcanoes as we speak blowing the top? Yes, 45. as a matter of fact, I Today. am. I, this yeah, is something like people, I check out but, somewhat frequently. Right. Yeah, and also the people, dramatic increase most, in, uh, in, right. in earthquakes. Yes, and in volcanic um, activity. Most yeah, it, people it, are it, not it, aware it's of it. It's gone up dramatically here, particularly yes. in the last year on a, on a consistent basis. Yes, and, sir. Uh-huh. And, and I describe it as, uh, as this. I describe Nibiru's return. Uh, it's beginning to come back in uh, from way, way far out um, uh, beyond Pluto uh, and crashing its way back again through the solar system. And I describe it as kind of like a, a bowling ball going down the alley and um, hitting the pins because as it goes through outer space, you know, our entire solar system is as sensitive as the human body. Uh, and uh, if you get a, you hit your toe real bad, uh, you get that signal up in your brain real fast, all right? Uh, if you have difficulty walking or, or, or problems with your uh, feeling on the end of the fingertips, you know all about that real quick. That, is, that is, affects your entire body. And that's what's happening already. That's why in the last few years, the tremendous numbers of, uh, of animals, uh, uh, the whales don't know how to, they don't know where to go. They don't know north from south. Um, the birds are having problems. The bees are having problems. They can't find their, uh, their hives, all right? Um, the, the other day, by the way, I also mentioned in the DVD, be aware of the aurora borealis starting to pick up. And uh, that's primarily uh, from solar flares and electromagnetic forces coming out of the sun. The sun, as we speak, in the last six months to a year, has had some of the craziest reactions to something that it has had in a thousand years. We're watching electromagnetic storms. Tomorrow, they're anticipating the possibility of us being hit tomorrow, actually, being hit with an extraordinary solar flare. We're gonna be lucky if it misses us because a big one took off day before yesterday. And if in fact, uh, depending on the, the location of it, when the sun was facing earth as to whether we get a big one or a little one. Janet Napolitano, when she quit her job in head of, the, um, uh, of uh, Homeland Security uh, several months back, 
about maybe a year ago now, and also James Wolseley, the head of the Central Intelligence. He quit about the same period of time. Both of them, upon leaving, made a statement that everybody better be aware that we will be struck by electromagnetic force, probably from the sun, that will shut down half of the globe electronically. They both said, in their actual words, it's not a matter of if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when. And they would not elaborate, they didn't get into the fact that it's uh, Nibiru's effects. But nonetheless, my opinion is, is that that's what's doing it. My opinion on the weather around the globe for the last six months, which has been extraordinary. I'm talking in Russia, they had floods in, in different parts of the globe, floods, uh, blizzards. They've had snow in, in, in Cairo, Egypt that they hadn't had in 150 years or something like that. I heard that, but I didn't get a lot of details. No. But all, I picked up it did. Well, that's my job. And all of it, all around the entire globe, it's going crazy. Now I'm going to give you a better one. I found out, and this is also in the DVD, I found out that uh, about a year ago or more, maybe even two years at this point in time, the planets starting out where Pluto is and coming back in towards the sun are slowly heating up in our solar system. They are bouncing, wiggling, or jiggling in their orbits. The surface of all of the, the basic planets have had entire changes in their chemistry on the surface of uh, all the major planets, et cetera, et cetera. All well, the planets, I wonder what would be affecting the, the basic uh, geochemistry of a planet. Uh, well, it, because, the, first off, the chemistry varies on all the planets. It's all different stuff. Some of it's gas, some of it's dust mixed with gas, mm -hmm. some of it's hydrogen, some of it's sulfates, et cetera. But because of just the changes in, um, uh, in heat and um, uh, atmospheric pressure, uh, movements, et cetera, uh, like, like making a wave in the bathtub, you know, if you push your hand in the tub at the one end, it's going to end up hitting the other end of the bathtub, and that's what's taking place with Nibiru at this point, and okay. all of Wait. its junk that's coming with it. Brother Bob, I got to jump yes, in sir. here real quick because we've got a uh, people in the chat room that's asking some questions, and we've got some uh, some other things that we want to touch base on before we uh, get done the show. We're down to about. 17 okay. minutes it's been just an incredible ride here and we sign off that's going to take us a couple minutes so really we got about okay give us give left. me a couple questions okay let's go ahead and do this brother john thank you very much for joining us here tonight and everybody tomorrow night at nine o'clock something to think about with brother john glenka right here on interstellar realities radio once again we're with bob fletcher that's bob fletcher investigations dot com and you need to go to that website and check out some of his research. I believe you will find it quite fascinating, to say the least. Uh, just a couple things from our chat room. We always like to let people know that we're reading and we're here with them. Uh, here, here's, here's a question here at the top one. Any chance of a link for photos or video? And I'm assuming they're talking about uh, some place they could see Planet X. Well, first off, uh, genuinely, in reality, um, any pictures of Planet X are questionable. I have some of them on the, uh, my DVD. The bottom line, it is uh, infrared. It's not, uh, it has to be seen by infrared telescope of sorts at this time. It does not generate its own light. When it comes in closer, you will see it as a star in the sky as it grows bigger and, and larger as it comes in to go around the sun. Um, but at this point in time, th see, here's the problem, and it's also something to, that's a little difficult to put a handle on. Uh, uh, the where is it? Okay, there's an argument as to whether it's 30 to 40 degrees off of our plane, what they call the plane of the ecliptic, which is where the uh, basically the planets are all on a reasonably flat plane. Okay. Uh, give or take a few hundred million miles, uh, all of our planets are pretty much on the same plane circling around, okay? 
if it is coming in on our plane, that's one thing. If it comes in, you know, coming in close to our our same plane that all the planets are on, that that's uh, one time schedule. If it's coming in from below or above on an angle of 30 degrees or so, which a lot of people think it is, uh, then it will be uh, a whole different story on the schedule of arrival. Uh, and the problem is if it's behind the sun at every, any given point in time, you know, it's like if somebody says, How, where can we see it? Where can we see this thing? I have a great telescope. Well, you probably you don't have one big enough unless you're the government. But number two, you don't know where to aim it. And the, the, the visual place where it may be at any given time would take an extraordinary amount of mathematical analysis. Once it starts coming in close enough to where it looks like a star and picking up the light from the, the sun itself or from other, other uh, sources, then you will see it. Now, according to calculation, I'm going to tell you when it's estimated to be coming in. This is going to upset some people. Um, by the way, let me give everybody, grab a pencil and a paper. I'm going to give you a separate address for those of you who are listening and may not have uh, computers. You, if those of you who are not computer, uh, let's say computer oriented, I'm going to give you an address where you can contact me and I'll, uh, I'll let you know how you can uh, uh, get a copy of the DVD. Now, uh, it's been calculated related to all of the information put together, put into a computer and kicking out the analysis of the most likely time for its return, the second least likely time, and then the third very least likely time to be passing back by. Now, this is going to upset some people. Um, the possibility is very high, according to Gil Bruchard and many other people, and the relationship to when it has been passing previously, is that it will be seen in December, and it will take several months for it to come close enough to go around the sun, but it will be seen in December of this year. And then we will have January, February, and then the key months for it to be closest to pass near the earth and causing the most trouble would be March and April of next year. All right, now, uh, and then it will head back out and whatever damage it's done will be finished, and uh, we, uh, uh, the, we'll be licking our wounds. If it is not seen, and what I'm talking about seen is where it's up there and it looks like a new star up there in the sky coming inward. It will be getting bigger every month, every week, a little bit bigger. It will look like a single star originally, even though there's probably a couple of moons going around with it and a lot of space junk. It'll be seen in December. It'll get bigger in January, February, and then March and April, make its journey around the sun and back out. The journey around the sun and back out is probably 155 days. Now, all of the best scriptures and, in, uh, the, and information related to when it had passed before and was written in, logged in, and drawn, sketched out, and all the rest of that, it has always been, apparently, in March and April, the, like the Passover period of time. All right? So yeah, if, in fact, well, and I would say if, in fact, we don't see it this, Jan this, this uh, December, and with it coming in, then we probably have a complete year to wait for it to come. If it still has not arrived in that second year from today, uh, if it's still not on its way in, then we would be into three years of March. Okay, in other words, March or April, three years from now. But the consensus is that it's very likely to be seen this December and to pass in the March of April of, uh, of next year. 
All right. Now, it's not my estimate. That's an estimate of other people that are uh, I consider to be the experts. The um, now here's something else that's very important. This is where the politics fits into this thing. The people that are keeping this secret from us, all right, a lot of people say, when will they tell us this is coming? They will never formally announce that this is coming in, all right? They are going to have to have, this is from the point of view of the bad guys, all right, the guys that had the tickets to go underground in the underground facilities and bring their families with them. All right, those guys are going to have to have martial law declared in the United States a few months before 100,000 astronomers start seeing this thing appearing on the horizon coming in as a new star. So what are we talking about? If the timeline is being seen first in December and January, they will have to have some form of martial law a few months before that in the United States. So they will have complete control over the general public when it starts to become a riot on the surface of the earth. If you told, if the leaders of any of the major nations came out and told the world that this thing is going to be coming in, in five months or two months or six months, that this thing was going to be coming by, uh, if in fact they did that, it would be the end of all things. The financing would be, the entire globe would go into riots. We think the people in ISIS are going nuts. Those guys over there with their raping and plundering of uh, the Saudi Arabia or with the Arabian area over there, we think they're crazy. You would see that on the entire globe if they announced it was going to happen. So it's not going to be announced. They will never tell us. Now, the next question is, what, what, how would they get away with declaring martial law? Because they have to have the, the general public to go along with it. They can't just do this. Uh, you know, they have to have the public believing that it's a good idea for martial law. All right, so it will be one of three things. It will either be some major terroristic acts, like 9-11 type thing, chemical, biological, or something like that, across the country in several places. Pull that off, the American public will accept martial law. If they announce that it looks like Russia is going to have a direct confrontation of World War III for some reason or another, and or Red China, that will be good enough for martial law. And the third one of possibility is the uh, obviously an outbreak of uh, an uncontrollable disease like Ebola or something like that, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting uh, large enough uh, that it would be a believable reason for martial law. One of those three is going to constitute, and again, the best sign for people to understand when this thing might be coming around is when you see that martial law genuinely starting to take place. So then that's going to be the only thing that the average American public is going to be able to understand. Uh, and again, it could be even uh, uh, the uh, solar flares. The solar flares that they were talking about, uh, the head of the CIA, James Wolseley, the solar flares that he and uh, uh, Janet Napolitano was talking about, um, those will, when they pass, when a solar flare is big enough and passes across the globe, it will burn every bit of electronics, starting with all of our satellites and then burning every single generation power on the globe, whether it's a, a, an entire globe or just half of it, that relates to how big and how much of a flare hits. When that happens, stop and think about it, folks. Everything is black. It's done. There's no power, no fuel, no food, no transportation, no police communication, 
nothing that depends on electronics will exist when one big solar flare does a trick on the globe. And uh, again, all of these uh, uh, will be part and parcel to the passing of Nibiru uh, whenever that takes place. And unfortunately, it looks like it may be within three years. And again, our sign that's going to be a realistic signature is going to be when they pull a need, the need for martial law in America. That's all I've got for you. Now, if you've got any more questions, uh, we're about running off the clock here. Yeah, we're just running off the clock, but I want to tell you, uh, Brother Bob, it's been a real pleasure having you on the air with us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Bob Fletcher from Bob Fletcher Investigations dot oh, com, and, and you can you can go over there right and now. Let me and and let me let me yes, you can do that. And those of you that don't have computers, got your pencil and paper. It's Bob Fletcher, Post Office Box two one six, Bayview. That's Box two one six. Bayview, Idaho, 83803. That's Bayview, Idaho, 83803, Box 216. Drop me a note. Uh, if you want the DVD, it's 24.95. We pay shipping, four hours, two discs. If you just want, drop me a note. I'll send you a copy of a catalog. For those of you who don't have computers, I was surprised uh, to find out the other day, uh, I did a program, and uh, I had fought, forgotten about the folks that don't have computers, and I put out the address, and uh, we had uh, 100 letters. So um, uh, whatever. It's a, it surprised me. There's a lot of people who still aren't plugged in out there. The writing is here. Do we know those lists? Yeah. Iset Isis Netir Hur Nebu, the Horus name Nusir Ra An Khidijit, the eternal seed or gift of life, or the eternal life gift. Nusir Ra is supposedly the name or who they relate the whole place to, this temple of the sun. He had another temple and a pyramid over there also related to him. And we can see that the writings also are not so, you know. Not so perfect, or not so perfect, yeah. Especially that they should draw it first and then carve it. It's not, it's not very special. Yeah, it's not. Um, there's other objects that Karnak quite. They look like tool marks. These ones. These are Here they hardly yeah, scratch that stone with any symbols. You can hardly see the symbol. Only. You can hardly see it. Yeah. Yeah. Same there again. You can see some of the bases made from limestone, and that each one has three drills. Again, the style of quarrying, yep. creating millstones. These millstones were important. <laughs> Very important. <laughs> For the quarrying. It was like the <laughs> every every like little village would have a special spot where they do the grain and stuff. Then these stones were needed. It's like the core of the factory. Mm. Wow, here we These are. These ones, yeah. Wow, unusual again. We've got three uh, holes. Yeah. We examined this, me, me and Stephen Miller, once and we thought like, like, why would this have three? You know, why wow, not two? Why not just one? And then again, you have it repeated again. Same yeah, again, yeah, three again. Yeah. So we thought that this, this could be actually like, some used to receive in, and some used to leave out, and one yeah. was above or something like that. But Valves and mechanisms. Not all be pouring in, same out. again over there, there nothing but three. Yeah. Even these ones are exactly the same size. Same is different product line over here. Yeah. Very You can see how the stone itself isolated from each other. Weathered. It's been weathered for god knows how many centuries. Two curious features as well, Yusuf, at the back, and you've got two channels as well, the unusual channels. Yeah, you've got three holes, but the two outside ones have a channel feeding them. Yeah, it was probably connected to copper pipes. Ancient hot maybe? Hmm? 
ancient hot tub. <laughs> That's what the Romans used. Mm -hmm. They used these once in Alexandria mm -hmm. and they made them actually a bathtub. Wow. They just recycled but them. It was, of course, one of similar to these basins. See, I don't, I still don't believe that the Carrara marble we find in, in Alexandria was brought by the Greeks or the Romans. Mm -hmm. Because these people got so used to recycle the stones they found on the site. Plus, there are other uh, evidence that supports my theory. Because we know that these shapes that they took from basalt or uh, Carrara marble, mm -hmm. they made it as a stand for the statues. Hmm? They usually put the statue on. So I examined one of them, and I saw that to house the statue on top of it, they used the poor style of hammering, while the piece itself is a clean cut, very similar to what we see in the Giza plateau, even if the type of stone was different. So, but they all say like anything that's manufactured out of uh, Carrara marble that has to be Roman. I don't think so. The Romans dismantled and quarried the site of the labyrinths that used to be 3,000 chambers on that site. They quarried almost all of it, or there could be a layer that's still buried underground. But these people did not bother bringing the stone from the other side of the sea to this country because of this, what they do, they wouldn't have the culture of the sword and occupying other countries to take their goodies. If you are able to create and construct this beautiful artifacts, you would need, wouldn't need to go and put war on other countries so you can take the goodies. If you can build and prosper, you will build and prosper and protect, not go exactly. put war on exactly. other countries. You can see examples for them in every side. Look. This part here also, this piece. Come on. This is part of the Roman use. When they used to also reuse these stones to make also create this drill bigger and to make it like another type of the millstone. Yep. They used Smaller and long and narrow. Different yeah. types. Yeah. This one was just another device Small. to smash the stuff in it, like herbs and stuff, mm -hmm. or spices. Good and one. the other one was the wheel. Round and flat. Yeah. Round and flat. This one tall and narrow, exactly. yeah? Exactly. Wow. Let's go up.